Titchmarsh was buying Ivan a fellow and Mary Ellis. So that, that's, oh. that's my confession. Thank you very much. But the story, to sing with Caruso, how did it come about? Well, um, I gave an audition for the opera people because my teacher wanted to find out where to send me to know more, you know, some little opera house somewhere on the continent and he thought I'd spend eight years there and come back and be able to sing Tosca and Bohem. But instead of which, after I've, uh, without any nerves at all, I've, I've been nervous ever since. <laughs> but uh, without any nerves at all, I saw these four people huddled up in a very huge dark auditorium. And I said, may I have a table and a chair, please? I want to do a scene from Manon. And I did. And then I almost fainted afterwards, <laughs> jittering. And uh, they asked me to sign a contract for four years. Gracious. And suddenly I was a wage earner and all that, and I just didn't know what to do with it. It was wonderful. How, what stage in his career was it then when you sang with him? Caruso? Oh, Caruso it, it was the next to the last performance. Oh, gosh. So was he... He wasn't supposed to be singing because he had this thing in his lung, and he insisted on going through with it. One performance in New York with Lelisa d'Amore, which I sang Giannetta, and... Then he went and sang one more performance in Brooklyn. So um, you knew he was ill at that, yes, at that time? Yes, yes. Yeah. But he was charming, sweet, kind, lovable, simple person. Rather the Pavarotti sort of temperament, you know, unspoiled and sang like a dream. I mean, one never can forget his voice, even though there is Pavarotti in Domingo now. They say he was a great practical joker, wasn't he? Well, I didn't know anything about that. I had no sense of humour when I was that young. <laughs> <laughs> but to see... Now, you must forgive me for, for dwelling on the past, because I know you're a real up-to-date, for goodness sake, let's get on with it. Yes. But I have to ask, what, what, what Sarah Bernhardt was like? Now, you saw... I thought she was awful. Really? <laughs> Why awful? Well, I saw her on her last journey, on her last tour, and she had a wooden leg, and I kept thinking of that when she was doing Phaedra, scenes from Phaedra, and she did a terrible little one-act play about um, a French soldier in the trenches. And I just couldn't forget it, you see. And, yeah. and I remember her golden voice, you know, all that business, and it gave one a bit of a shiver. But as for, I was terribly disappointed because she had red frizzy hair down to here, and she couldn't smile because her teeth were rather black. <laughs> but otherwise... She was oh, fine. why she was fine! <laughs> but I, I was a, a doozy fanatic, because I saw her in my Eleonora. youth. Eleonora. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother took me to see her, and she was playing a play called The Cita Morta, uh, which she had to play a girl of 16. I said, but mother, she can't do that. She's an old lady with white hair. I should talk that way now. <laughs> and Mother said, wait. And she came on and you never questioned it. She was 16. She was the most amazing actress. Wonderful. It's amazing. I always tend to think of you as English. I mean, you're so English, but, but you're a New Yorker. I was born in New York, I think, sort of by accident. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> my father was from the continent, a mixture of French and German on the Alsace-Lorraine borders. And uh, so I learned French and German. I spoke French and German before I spoke English, really. What were those, the times in the 20s like in New York? It's the times that, that all of us were told, oh, that was the time to well, go to New York. Well, uh, I was so ambitious, and so was everybody else my age, that we did nothing but work. I mean, we didn't have holidays there. And the Christmas week, we played two performances a day. That kind of thing. But you were working with people like, meeting people like Gershwin, which... Well, um... George, George was, um, I was a little bit in love with him, but he was in love with Sasha Heifetz's sister, so it didn't come to anything. Never, you could have been almost Mrs. Gershwin, that's the point. No, no. No chance. No, but he, he was a wonderful friend. And I had 10 days off of Rosemary at that time. I was only 23, so everything was wonderful. And I had laryngitis and had to stay in bed. And he came to the flat and said, Mary, how do you like this? I composed it 
yesterday. It's the second half of something. And he played on my piano that wonderful second half of the Rhapsody in Blue. Da, 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 da. And that was it. I, so, I mean, I felt I was in on the sort of the start making of it. Of it. So if you well, come to the present. Oh, I know, but I'm just thinking that you could have made it go, da, 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 and it would never have gone anywhere, would it? You know, <laughs> you had the sense to say, yes, George, it's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but what about the present? You're still well, the working present, today. I'm the happiest time of my life at mm. the moment, because I'm old enough to be able to say no. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, to anything, you know, I mean, I, uh, when one's young, one wants to please people and do everything that may further liking and love and pleasure and work. And one's apt to sort of do things outside of one's common sense. So now you're sensible about it. And now that. I'm sensible and too old to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Alan, I've, Alan I've been given a chance of sort of a, a second life, really, to get in harness again, one with this, um, this lovely interview. And then I was given a small part in the last of the Sherlock Holmes TVs that is coming. Now you're playing the Duchess of Flint, is it, in that? Oh, it's some kind of Lady Florence, her name is. <laughs> and she's rather a formidable... Victorian lady. It's a very small part, but I enjoyed every minute. You were on Radio 4 at Christmas, d doing a, a programme then? Yes. Uh, uh, it had the ominous title of 92 and still working. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lovely programme. I loved it. Do you, you don't mind reminiscing too much, then? You do, you can... um, I, like, I like living now as much as possible, apart from the modern music, mm, mm. the very modern music, I mean, I, I still can't understand that. Well, you see, you worked with that man who crafted some of the finest melodies ever. I mean, it's fitting that I we know. should talk yes. about him. But you know what's going to happen. I mean, now the young people have reached the 50s and the 40s, possibly a little bit of the 40s. But by the time the next generation has a cult about the 30s, they may want romantic music again. And I think Ivor will come into sort of a second life. I, I don't understand why people don't like him, because he's been the link between the Viennese operetta and, and the American and English opera of Hammerstein and Lloyd Webber. Mm. And he, if he hadn't been, if he hadn't done Glamorous Night and Dancing Years, I'm not sure they would have had the courage to have that kind but of I don't thing. think anybody can knock a good tune, and he was a great craftsman of writing tunes that have... He was a great then. musician. Mm. I mean, he played the piano wonderfully, and he knew every, every instrument in the orchestra, which was so wonderful. At a dress rehearsal, for instance, if the orchestra played something, he'd say, stop, I don't want the trumpet there. You know, yeah. or something like yeah. that. You felt that he was in charge of the music. There was always talk of, of, of that sort of, how gentle it was, I don't know, that rivalry between Ivan Novello and Coward. I mean, oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't rivalry, they're totally different. I mean, Noel Coward was wonderful for his wit and his lyrics. He wasn't the musician that Ivan was at all. They, they were, uh, no, there was no rivalry. It, I, I, at uh, Ivan's first night parties up in his flat, Noel would come and they'd sit on the edge of the little platform where the piano was and I'd hear this going on and Noel would say, yes, Ivo, very nice, very nice, but you know, you ought to change this, this, this. and I would just sit there with that beautiful face saying, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and not do a thing. Is it? <laughs> well, it, they seem to be times of... I won't say hedonistic fun, but times when people were not afraid to really enjoy themselves. It was, it was pure escapism, and in a way you seem to live escapism as well. Oh, no. No? You live just absolutely... This is what one must know. You don't get beautiful things written, or you don't write wonderful plays, or you don't sing well, unless you work terribly hard. And unless there's a self-discipline, and that is what we've lost. Mm. It took, in those days, nobody would have dreamed of singing without studying music and singing and everything that could be possibly connected with it for about eight years. 
before you opened your mouth in public. Exactly. Mm. Well, I, I think it's wonderful what happens to young people now. I mean, you can have personality and be able to carry a tune, and you can be a star of the night. I think it's marvelous. But it's going to take away a, a certain wonderful exhilaration of, a, of, of achievement. What made you make the break from doing musicals and from being a singer, basically, to being a straight actress? I mean, you're doing I didn't again, make the break. I made the break from straight theatre to doing a musical. Mm. Because the opera, I shut off completely. My mother and father were very distressed about it because they were very serious musical people. And I remembered all my life what my father said. Well, yes, all right, if you're a success. But remember through everything, life comes first. And I think that is the important thing to know. You've done it very much recently with, with writing. I mean, you're writing short stories now. You wrote your autobiography. Well, I wrote the first thing I ever wrote was in school when I was 12. And uh, I got a, a silver cup for it. <laughs> about that time. And you're still doing it now? I love writing, yes, because it's a sort of an untrammeled way of expressing yourself. I mean, you can go through... I once knew a very fine painter, and he said to me, unless what you paint comes up from the ground and is trying to come out of your fingertips, don't try to paint. Well, I feel that way about words. So it seems to me that, that what Mary Ellis has done through her life is, if you like, follow her passions, as well as following her secret heart, she followed her passions as well and did what was right at the moment. Well, I, 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 why do you call it passion? That always insinuates something beyond control. And I think one of the first things one has to learn in work anyway, if you like to be uncontrolled in life, that's your own business. But um, I think in work one must be in control. Well, you've... So it isn't passion, it's dedication. I'll stick with that. I wouldn't argue. It's been a pleasure to meet a lady whose record I bought at 14 and to discover that she's great fun. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Ellis. <laughs> <laughs>